Hi there everyone. Here at the Royal Society there are three shelves of early letters from 1660 to 1740. Now one letter in particular right here in this volume labelled G has been making headlines all around the world in the last few weeks. Something in here is a bit of a big deal and today we're going to get it out, show it to you and tell you the story. Let's so, do it. Let's do it. All right then, now you may have figured out, G, we're going to be talking about Galileo. But before we look at this, Keith Moore, head librarian at the Royal Society, mm -hmm. has dug out something else for us. Bit of a history lesson. What have mm. we got here, Keith? Well, I thought we'd have a look at one of Galileo's tracts. So this is in our tract series. And if you open it to the first page, you'll see we have Siderius Nuncius by Galileo, just here. I see, in case you missed it, someone there has underlined Galileo for you. That was kind mm. of them, wasn't it? Okay. So this is from 1610, and this is Galileo writing about the new things he can see using this piece of technology called the telescope. Very pretty illustrations to this. So this is seeing the moon with a telescope for the first time. It's opening up a whole new world for Galileo. Mm. And if you turn a little further on, here we go. Oh, look, you can see he begins to show you some constellations. And very famously, later on in the volume, he'll show you some of the moons of Jupiter. OK, so here we go. The four brightest, biggest moons around Jupiter. They're now known as the Galilean satellites. But he was noticing them in different places around Jupiter each night. So this really begins to get Galileo thinking about the nature of the solar system. And of course, very famously, the question of the time was did everything revolve around the earth or did everything revolve around the sun all right and here he's seeing something that appears to be revolving around jupiter so this is like exactly Whoa. so the, it's not as easy as just that kind of very simple view of everything turning around the earth uh, as the scriptures would at the time thought would have us believe i'm sure galileo would have written to his friends mind blown What's going on here? Now this does lead to some trouble, doesn't it? And this is gonna lead us to the letter in volume G. What happens, Keith? What causes all the problems? Well, Galileo starts thinking about how to defend the idea of using direct observation in science as, as a means of finding out about the universe, as opposed to just relying on what the scriptures tell you about it. So basically, Keith, Galileo writes this really famous letter to a mathematician about what he's been discovering, but he's trying to tread the line between his new paradigm-changing discoveries yeah. and what it says in the Bible. And this letter gets him in some trouble, doesn't it? Well, it does. He sends it to Benedetto Castelli, who's a friend of his in 1613, and there are questions about Galileo's thinking at this time, and this letter is, is evidence. So he asks for it back, makes a few changes, just really to soften the arguments a little bit and to, to make them more presentable. This was the Roman Inquisition, of course, so it was it was dangerous time. And the big problem was, as I understand it, there was a copy of the first letter he wrote, maybe, yeah. and there was a copy of the second toned down letter. That's These right. were both circulating. Galileo was saying the first one, he was saying fake news, that's a fake. I never wrote that stuff. I only ever wrote the soft one. Other people were saying, yes, you did. You're changing your story. Mm -hmm. And for hundreds of years, people haven't really known what the truth was. This brings us to early letters, G. Mm. There's a letter in here, and recently it was read by a scholar here at the Royal Society who mm. was visiting, and he's made a bit of a big deal about it. It's been in all the papers, and we've, we've read all about it. Let's have a look at this letter, what yeah. it says, and how this fits into the story. Right at the start of the volume, isn't it, Keith? So that's right. This is early letters, volume G, G1, letter number one. It goes without saying, I'm not going to be able to read this. <laughs> <laughs> Can I touch it? Can I? Yes, do. I mean, turn the pages, by all means. It's written in Italian. We have got a translation in English, which I may refer to in a moment. It has been repaired quite heavily in its lifetime, as you can see. Here at the end, we have GG, Galileo, Galilei, mm -hmm. 1613. 1613. So this is a copy of the controversial, famous letter in question, but this one maybe was written by Galileo himself? So that's the current thinking. That's what the scholar is putting forward as the idea that this is in Galileo's own handwriting and therefore this is the original letter that he sent to Castelli and then requested back again to make changes. And the reason that's interesting, there is crossing out and changing apparently in this letter and it is examples of some of the more inflammatory words that have been changed to, well, 
kinder words, more diplomatic words? More diplomatic, I think. So really the sense of the arguments doesn't change. It's just that the language is slightly toned down. So, for example, apparently he's crossed out the word false at one point and replaced it with look different from the truth. And another time he talked about the scriptures concealing things and he's changed that to a weaker word like veiling. If this is what we think it might be, this is him rewriting history, rewriting what he said the first time. Well, just, just, just you know, redrafting in it such a way that it would be acceptable to his contemporaries. I mean, Galileo wasn't irreligious in any sense, you know, he believed in the scriptures. He, he simply believed that nature was God's own work too and you could get the truth from that. Now Keith, I've been reading some of the articles about this and it has come across in many ways that this was a letter that was kind of lost to history and almost people didn't know it was sitting here and this scholar sort of stumbled over it almost through some sort of serendipity and it yeah. caught everyone by surprise. Yeah, yeah. Has this caught you by surprise? I uh, know. I, I've always known about the letter and, and in fact so has everyone else who, who uses the Royal Society library and cares to look at the catalogue. So uh, some of the press reports said it would be misfiled. Not true, it's in early letters G1, letter number one. You couldn't get much more file than that. Uh, it's on our online catalogues, it's been in our published catalogues before. Um, it's even been reproduced on, on microfilm so people could see the, the original uh, document and compare the handwriting had they so desired. So it, it's kind of an open secret if you like. An open secret. I mean, the yeah. letter's even been repaired, so obviously people yeah. have cared for it. But it's not clear, even to you, whether or not Galileo wrote it. Couldn't you pick up the phone to someone else who has a Galileo letter and say, we th we've got this letter, we think it might be dynamite. It might answer this really old, famous question in science. Can you guys help us with a handwriting comparison? Or, or is that not your job? Is that the job of the scholars? That's the job of the scholars. So we make the material available, we describe it, we tell people what we have then it's up the scholars to go and do something with it. Keith, there has been a little bit of debate about the filing of this letter in terms of dates. There seem to mm. be different dates attached to it. Well, that's right. So you can see here, just on the end there, you've got an X B R E 1613. Now, what it's saying is the 10th month of the year. But of course, if you were a Latinate scholar, you'd know very well that December decem was the original 10th month of the year. So what he's saying here is it's, it's December 1613. So it's slightly misdated, but it's one of the common mistakes that archivists make when they're very inexperienced. So at some point in the past, a Royal Society archivist said that this was a letter from October, yeah. when in fact it was from December. It's not really an issue, I don't think, and most scholars would have realised immediately what had happened. The provenance of the letter is an interesting question that we don't know the answer to. Early scientists did exchange letters, so it may have come into the society through that kind of a route. Keith, if this one letter in one volume amongst all these shelves and all these archives you have down here caused so much excitement, mm. what else have you got down here that can cause this much excitement? Well, you know, Brady, it's all exciting. I, I get excited every day when I come down to the archives because there's always new things that you can learn and we're acquiring new material all the time. So there's always discoveries to be made in an archive. And that's one of the fun things about working here. So this is a discovery, but it was, but you knew about it anyway. Yeah, it was a discovery that was kind of, yeah, we knew about it. In case we haven't made it clear, these are wood blocks used for Principia's. So we could actually go into the copy of Principia here and match up these wood blocks with the figures in the document. But we're not going to do that today. Ah, of course we're going to do that. Come on then, <laughs> let's have a look. Okay, so here we go. I'm on page 14 here of Principia and have a look. There's the woodblock, there's the figure. And you can see one feature of this type of printing is that the image needs to be made in reverse. If you see these little letters, they have to be done backwards because it would be printed ah. like that. 